America this morning. Have a great day, everyone. It's Wednesday, October 26th. They had to have a code word in case of a school shooting, and they needed it. We start here. Police in St. Louis shed light on a shooting at a performing arts school in the gunman's massive arsenal. AR-15 style rifle and more than 600 rounds of ammunition. Why a note is concerning police beyond this one attack. Republicans have run on crime. Will they win on crime? We had relatives shooting each other at, at cookouts. Our team spoke to cops, activists, and voters. We'll take you along for the ride. And we were told there's a great future in plastics. The problem isn't with recycling. The problem is with plastics. But is any of the stuff you're throwing in the recycling bin actually getting recycled? From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Central Visual and Performing Arts High School is the country's oldest public high school west of the Mississippi River. It sits right along the Western Bank in St. Louis, Missouri. And yesterday, around 9 a.m., students were just beginning their weeks. That's when a man came in with a gun. Shots fired. They still shoot. Oh, my God. Hours later, we still knew very little, but we did know this man had killed two people and injured several more. We knew he had been killed in a shootout with police, but we didn't quite know how this unfolded or why. Well, we do today. So let's go straight to ABC's Alex Perez, who rushed to the scene, who's been talking to authorities as they pieced this tragedy together. Alex, I mean, what have you learned in the last 24 hours? Well, uh, Brad, this community is, of course, shaken up. There were parents who were running to the scene right after they found out about this shooting, literally moments right after. They're shooting. She doesn't know how many, she didn't know how many people it was. So I just left work. And I just ran here to get her. In tears, trying to figure out if their loved ones, if their children were okay. Uh, there were images of the teenagers, the, the students here running out of the building. <laughs> trying to get somewhere safe, fearing that they would not make it out alive. So this clearly was uh, something that really, really shook up this community. And really, the school day was just beginning here. Uh, it was about 9, 10 in the morning when uh, suddenly uh, students reported hearing gunshots, gunfire on the third floor of the school building. Report of a shooting at the high school. He is not here. So I wasn't believing it, but then they called Mal Davis on the intercom. That's when I was kind of more believing it. And we went to the uh, counselor's office and we put a big old bookshelf over the door. This and school, like many schools across the country, they train for situations like this. And the principal came on to the intercom system in the school and uh, said the special phrase hmm. that is code for students here to get into lockdown mode and protect themselves. And that's uh, what happened, what they heard. And then they went into uh, that, what they trained for as soon as they heard that. Wow. So that's like a thing the school and I imagine many schools have been preparing for a moment just like that. Did students describe what it was like in those moments afterwards? Yeah, you know, some of the students were actually live streaming from inside those classrooms, but uh, uh, many of them barricaded themselves inside the classroom. Like we had to jump out the windows and stuff, and then we all get out here. I'm crying, running across the street, trying to find my friends, thinking, like, is they okay? Is they there okay? were some students who fled to the rooftop of the building, uh, thinking that would be a way to escape here. Um, it was really complete chaos for those few seconds. And as you might imagine, you know, these students have, have unfortunately grown Grown up seeing these shootings happen at other campuses, and they know that if they don't act quickly, um, their life could be in danger. And so we saw that reaction here uh, immediately once they determined what was happening. My friend has all blood on her hand, and it was like she seen the shooter, and they, the shooter came to her and said, "You ready to die?" And then see her just scr screaming and crying, and it was just hurt me, and we all was just real scared. We know that killed in all of this by the gunman uh, was a 61-year-old uh, health teacher. She was also a cross-country coach here. Uh, reading her bio, she talked about how she loved working with students. She cared about those kids. Like, every day she came into school, she put herself 
between them and harm, between them and danger. We she spoke with some people who knew her and, and, and they said she was the kind of teacher that would get in front of a bullet for her students. And uh, mm. in this case, she died uh, protecting her students, trying to protect her students. And then the second fatal victim here was uh, a 15 year old uh, sophomore. And we've learned uh, that uh, she, Alexandria Bell, um, was uh, on the varsity dance team. Uh, friends say she was always smiling and that she really, really loved to dance. Um, her family, of course, heartbroken, like every parent. They don't expect that when they send their child to school that they're not going to come home alive. Yeah, those victims, Alexandria Bell and Jean Kushka. Uh, Alex, who was the shooter? He was older than these students, right? Any connection to the school at all? Yeah, so still a lot of unanswered questions about the shooter, but there are a few things that authorities have told us. He's uh, 19 years old, Orlando Harris, and they say that he actually graduated from this school last year. Mm. Now, authorities say he, he came here with the intention of killing people. He had a AR-15 style rifle and more than 600 rounds of ammunition. Wow. Much of that, uh, authorities said, was on a vest on his chest. This could have been much worse. Um, the individual had almost a dozen 30 round, you know, high capacity magazines on him. That's a whole lot of victims there. Authorities also have revealed now, Brad, that uh, he left a note a note in his vehicle, which was parked outside this school. And uh, investigators didn't reveal too many of the details that were in that note, but they did reveal one part that they felt was important for the community to hear. And it was th the shooter talking about his mental health. He wrote, quote, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I've never had a girlfriend. I've never had a social life. And that he feels so alone that all of these feelings combined were perfect for him to become a mass shooter. His words, according to uh, wow. authorities here in St. Louis. Well, and, and Alex, I got to imagine that's concerning to law enforcement more broadly, right? That, 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 that the model of the school shooter might have become so ingrained in our brains as a society that you might have a kid, you know, teenagers all the time think about sort of where they fit in the world. And if you have a, a tall teenager, he goes, well, maybe I should play basketball. I don't know. Maybe that's what I'm meant to do. Are we to take away from his words that, that somebody might go, oh, well, I'm lonely and depressed. That means I fit the model of the school shooter, that I should go and start getting some ammo. Sadly, it seems just from the little we know uh, that appears to be the connection. But what investigators uh, wanted to do in revealing that portion of what he wrote was uh, really open up a sort of lifeline for those people who are depressed, for those who may feel they have some sort of mental health issue or, or, or are afraid to get help. It's important that all of us be engaged so that we can try to intercede as early as possible in a person's life to try and prevent a tragedy from occurring. Police officials here have made it clear they want those people who are struggling to, uh, you know, turn to the resources that are available to them. And, and they're asking people, family members, friends who know someone who might be in the situation to also speak up, um, making it a point here that this is going to be a community effort to try to help anyone who may be in a dark situation like this. Yeah, and we should say the new National Crisis Hotline 988 was originally created as a lifeline for people struggling with thoughts of suicide. It's now accepting calls 24-7 for any type of mental health crisis. Great resource there. Again, 988. We will have more in our show notes. Alex Perez there in St. Louis. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Up next on Start Here, there's real crime and then there's perceived crime. Both are having an impact on the midterms. We'll be back in a bit. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. 
A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. If there was any doubt about which party is on the rise right now, this close to the midterm elections, polling won't necessarily predict everything for you. There's actually not as many high quality polls this cycle. But what you can do is follow the money. Seeing Republican momentum, Democrats have started shifting money away from seats they were hoping to target to seats they're hoping to salvage. They're talking less about issues where they're polling well, like abortion, and pivoting to spots where Republicans have made significant inroads, prices, wages, and crime. Crime has been one of the defining issues of this campaign, both in cities where crime is rising and also where it's falling. So as part of our series on the issues driving this year's midterms, we asked ABC's White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks to once again go to a city where the issue is front and center, in this case, Toledo, Ohio, and ask why this message is resonating so much right now. So with that, in our second installment of her series, here's Mary Alice Parks. Toledo Police Chief George Crawl has an impressive office with a big wood desk, framed American flag, and rows of awards. Okay. Chief Crawl, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. We're weeks before the midterm elections, but in his office, we're talking about early 2020. We're social people. We're not meant to be locked in, a, in our houses with, our, with one person or two people. And I think that coupled with the George Floyd murder and the issues we've had with that, I mean, it, it all was a perfect storm when it comes to a uh, spike in the violent crime in this, in this country. He tells me, in his opinion, people got stir crazy, sick and tired of being sick and tired. At the start of the lockdowns, crimes like burglaries were down in Toledo, but then homicides rose. This has been the deadliest year when it comes to homicides in the history of Toledo. Another busy weekend for Toledo police. And leaving residents shaken by the violence in the streets. We had relatives shooting each other at, at cookouts. We had a, a sister who shot her brother over a PlayStation uh, game. The whole legal system slowed too. We talk about what it was like for his team back then as crime spiked. And we're not holding people in jail because we, we don't want people in jail to get sick. So they completely, they told our, our people, go ahead, take my gun. I'll be, out in, I'll be out in three hours and I'll have another gun in five hours. It's not just the police who point to the pandemic lockdowns. Tell me about this area. Well, this is the south side or south end of Toledo. I walk with Brother Muhammad Washington through the more residential Roosevelt neighborhood in Toledo. Have you seen a change in crime in this area? I, my biggest uh, change that I saw was maybe um, when a lot of the youth programs, when there was a lot of lack of funding for youth programs, and I thought that the summer job program, the uh, some of the after-school programming and the um, weekend programs were beneficial for our community. And after that left, you saw a spike of violence and all types of things. Brother Washington is a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement here. We sit with a colleague of his, Avis Files, who works with the Brothers and Sisters United program, and she agrees. I think that the pandemic caused a rise in trauma um, so that our communities were already faced with trauma um, due to lack of everything. And then the pandemic did anything but exasperate that lack. So lack of communication, lack of resources. Um, and then I think even the racial, I consider it to be a racial pandemic as well. The issues that led to the rise in crime seen not only here in Toledo, but around the country in 2020 and 2021 are absolutely complex. But the numbers are so stark. Before the pandemic, Toledo averaged about 30 homicides a year. That number doubled in 2020, and by 2021, 71 homicides in the city. 
An analysis done by ABC News found over two dozen cities around the country broke their own previous records for homicides in 2021. I just went by a few blocks where on my left, there was corn stalks as high as my car. Houses are getting more and more spread out. About 30 minutes outside Toledo, the Springfield Township got so big and so worried about crime, mostly burglaries and break-ins, they voted last year to increase local taxes to pay for their own new police force. And it would just take too long to get to that call? Or there were too many calls? Both? The both. It's sort of a unique area. You know, we got a rural, we got a little bit of farming, we got some, you know, a lot of developments too. So we, we sort of got a mix. Tom Anderson, who's a local township trustee and helped lead the effort, tells me he thinks the vote was both a long time coming and that people have been more anxious lately. Crime is pretty much everywhere. You, you know, um, the city of Toledo, you know, you hear about some crime there. Um, I lost a friend down there to a shooting. Um, you know, does it deter some people from going in and out of, out of Toledo? I haven't seen it yet. I mean, I'm not... I'm not a fan of going down there after I lost my friend. Spikes in crime, whether real or perceived, have framed so much of these midterm elections. I was raised on this street where my grandma taught me that in America, kids can dream big. But we had something then that Ohio kids don't have today, safety. Republicans from Ohio to Washington state trying to speak to those anxieties or maybe more cynically, trying to capitalize on them. Where 10 or 15 years ago, it was bipartisan to accept that, for example, that we should go after violent criminals and throw violent criminals in jail. Republican J.D. Vance, running for Senate here in Ohio against Congressman Tim Ryan, has made crime a cornerstone of his campaign. So let's declare war on the violent crime in our streets. Let's let the police go and do their jobs, and let's support them as we do it. That's what In his crowd, we heard a mix from voters, though. Some told us it really was not an issue where they live, but many said it was absolutely still front of mind. I do agree that crime is a severe problem, not just in Ohio, but all across the country. So I am not seeing it in my very small community, in my rural community in Ohio, but I know that in the larger communities that there are issues with with crime. In terms of polling, crime was listed fourth as the issue most important to voters come November in our latest ABC News Washington Post poll. But voters in that poll said they trusted Republicans to handle the issue over Democrats by 14 points. Again, part of the reason for the heavy campaigning. John Fetterman wants to release convicted murderers from prison. Raphael one I call police thugs. They cut the funding. It's hard not to notice that most of the Republican ads and talking points are light on specifics, but very heavy on the blame game. Tim, fight the criminals, not the cops. I'm J.D. Vance, and I approve this message. Republicans have tried to cast Democrats as anti-police and have worked overtime to tie them all to that defund the police slogan, even in races where the Democratic candidates do not support cuts to police budgets. Well, I think that defaulting to crime as a political strategy is a relatively easy dunking point. Leah wright Rigur is a history professor at Brandeis University and an ABC News political contributor. It's one of those things that riles people up. It's one of these things that people gravitate to. I mean, who's going to sit down and say, no, I'm, you know, I'm pro-crime. Nobody's going to say that. But if we have a very policy-oriented conversation around crime, We also have to have a conversation around economics. We need to have a conversation around low-income communities, low-income populations. All of these kind of things that people are like, well, actually, I don't want to actually have a conversation about that. We all grew up respecting the police, our moral values, doing what we could do to help law enforcement in this country. In the last few weeks, there have been moments where racial and racist undertones in all this talk of crime have been more blatant and obvious. Speaking at a rally next to former President Trump, Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville implied all criminals are all simply black. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparation because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. They are not owed that. 
Back in Ohio, J.D. Vance, the Republican Senate candidate, does not list specific legislation he would back, but talks broadly about backing the blue. So we need to hire probably 100,000 additional cops in this country. You need resources in order to do it. Uh, the second thing is we really have to protect police officers' qualified immunity. Chief Carl agrees that in Toledo he does need more police, but he says it's hard to recruit. No one wants to be the next viral video. No one wants to get ambushed while they're sitting in their cars. Carl gives local courts a lot of credit for working overtime today to try to catch up, but he tells me he still worries about a backlog. I talked to a judge recently who told me that it's going to be two and a half years before they get caught up just on their dockets. And, and as for those ads and all the political attention on the issue, Carl says it doesn't help. We, we, I think we went two months without a homicide, but it was the lead story. I, you see it long enough. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You, you hear something or say something for a long enough time, you start believing it to be true. As the pandemic has faded, there have been signs of progress. An analysis of crime data by ABC News and the Gun Violence Archive shows that after two years of increased shootings, homicides are down nearly 5% in our nation's 50 biggest cities so far this year. New York and Chicago have seen double-digit decreases, and they're down in Toledo this year, too. Talk to me about the relationship you feel with the police, and if you feel like part of the answer is more cops on the beat or not. Uh, we've always had a gap in our relationship with the um, Toledo Police Department. There's always been some apprehension. Brother Washington and his colleagues bristle at the idea of simply adding more cops to the beat. For them, police conduct is still a major issue. Here's Avis Files again, along with David Bush, a city commissioner. I've been asked about the thing about having cops in our community and within our spaces and places. And like, well, black people don't want cops. That's not true. Mm -hmm. What we don't want is bad. I don't want bad food, bad teachers, bad cops, bad anything, right? But if somebody breaks in my house, who do you think I'm calling? I'm calling the cops, right? While there is crime, I, I am literally more afraid of the police and what they might do to me or what they might mistakenly do to a young man that's in my community yeah. who is working towards changing his life and changing his values. These activists tell me crime will only get better if politicians are willing to engage. Do you guys feel too often like you're being talked about in the political arena? Yeah. Yes. Not talked to? Absolutely. Absolutely talked about and not talked to. Talked and at. Sometimes, and talked talk, at. Yeah. Uh, talked at, right? Because people are quoting what they think but not, they've not had the conversation with us. How does it feel to be talked about? You feel like you're in a room and somebody's talking about you, but you don't get the comment, right? So we feel disenfranchised. This group, living right here in Toledo and working on all the complexities that contribute to crime, is frankly frustrated by both parties. They feel used by Republicans, those fearful ads and tired tropes, but used by Democrats in other ways. Democrats have long expected urban centers to come out and vote blue, but they want to see answers, accountability, and progress, too. When we have the same politicians showing up at our, our cookouts, our get-togethers, saying the same thing, uh, I'm going to vote, and I'm going to encourage everyone to vote. However, um, the politicians are going to have to give us something to vote for. Such a good encapsulation of so many voters. Give us something to vote for. Many thanks to Mary Alice Parks for that report. And one last thing. I feel like this is me every few days. Hey, honey, do you have any more recycling that we need to take out in there? We take recycling very seriously in my household. Paper, glass, even those little plastic tabs that I have to rip off to eat my trail mix. Don't be putting those in my trash can, which is why I was so horrified this week to read a report from Greenpeace claiming virtually none of my plastic is actually being recycled. American households produced about 51 million tons of plastic last year, and only 2.4 million of those tons were actually recycled. It's Lisa Ramsden who authored this big report. I'm a senior plastics campaigner with Greenpeace USA. And she says even if you empty, rinse, put your recycling in a separate bag and ship it off, that plastic bottle just does not break down the way you thought it does. So the problem is isn't with recycling. The problem is with plastics. Plastics are a really difficult material to recycle. One of the major issues is that there are so many types of plastic. You know those little numbers on your plastic bottles? Sometimes it's a one in that little triangle. Sometimes it's a two or a five or a six. Well, no facilities process 
all those different things. You know those plastic clamshells from your local restaurant? Only 11% of American recycling facilities actually process them. Plastic solo cups from your beer pong adventure? Only 9% of facilities take those. The number for those plastic knives and forks in your to-go order that I just hopefully toss in my recycling bin, that's 0%. Even bottles and jugs, which are very much recyclable, are not just made out of one chemical, and in breaking them down at the plant, a lot of it's just burned off or rinsed into the ocean as microplastics. What's more, Lisa says, is corporations know this. Corporations actually worked with industry groups to kind of create what plastics recycling is now. Showing our children what is important and saving our environment is so easy. Just choose to reduce, reuse, and recycle. You know, if they create a bunch of plastic bottles and put them out into the world, they don't have to worry about it because it's up to the consumer to then take that bottle and put it in a recycling bin. And so they can kind of wipe their hands clean of all the plastic that they're producing. So what are we supposed to do? Just toss everything in a bonfire? Lisa says, no, relax. First of all, paper, glass, and metal recycling definitely works. That's actually why we know the plastic thing is going so poorly. She says pressure should be added to plastic bottle makers to change their ways. We used to be able to get a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle that we would then return to the stores. It would be cleaned out, sanitized, refilled, and then sold again. Like this that exact bottle. Concept. Yes, exactly. It's not a new concept. It's how the milkman used to get milk to people, um, and we used to return those bottles, and they would be cleaned and refilled. Even so-called compostable plastic is not a great solution, she says. We're constantly being told to reuse and recycle. When it comes to plastic, though, perhaps only one of those is really working. My jaw just sunk lower and lower as she was describing this to me. So here's a good thing to know. On your bottle, if you look at the little recycling symbol, ones and twos on your plastic bottle, whatever, those are good to go. Like every recycling facility takes those. The lower down you go, the less likely. You can still send them in, but the overwhelming message here is use less plastic and don't fool yourself into thinking it's all getting recycled somewhere. Start here tomorrow. Hit that follow button for a new episode every morning. I'm Brad Milky. See you tomorrow. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, life 